the the person I was working with, Bob Stickold, who's kind of like the godfather of like putting together <clears throat> our modern way of looking at sleep and memory, and he mm -hmm. really was the one who, him and Jan Born in Germany, they really um, created the methodology that we all use right now. So he was my mentor, um, along with me and Matt Walker were in the same lab. And when um, what's interesting about his research is he was always looking at a full night of sleep and showed that you need to have six to eight hours of nighttime sleep to show any performance improvements. Mm -hmm. And if you understand that, it's because you need to have a lot of slow wave sleep mm -hmm. in the first part of the night, and then you need to wait the whole night to get a bunch of REM sleep, right? right? But in naps, what's interesting is you have what I call a shadow cycle, is that basically that circadian rhythm continues you know, you have very low sleep pressure, which is your need for slow wave sleep. So in the morning, you've got very low um, uh, amounts of slow wave sleep in the nap, but you have this circadian pressure to have high REM sleep. Mm -hmm. So your naps in the morning have a lot of REM sleep. Your naps in the evening, because of this buildup of your need for slow wave sleep, you have a lot of slow mm -hmm. wave sleep in your evening naps. And then if you do one more click, there's a there's a midpoint in the day where your naps have equal amounts of slow wave sleep and REM. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to look at those periods where you can actually have sort of a mini night in the middle of um, the day. And this is also the period where siesta cultures usually take naps, right? Mm -hmm. This one to three is, is this natural time where right. people have decreased core body temperature, decreased functioning, they're tired. Maybe this is some sort of a natural state, it is us napping. Mm -hmm. So let me see. If, I think it's the next slide. Um, so what I first um, looked at was, this is with, without the animation, is a little bit hard to understand. But basically what I found was that when I gave people a perceptual task, we're coming on to perception now, mm -hmm. um, I gave people a perceptual task and I tested them several times across a day, what I found is what happened in the blue line is that performance just deteriorates. We're right. not able to maintain our optimal levels of performance across a day. If I gave somebody a nap that was about a 60 minute nap, their performance would get back to baseline and stay at baseline, which means that they didn't show that deterioration that the no nappers um, showed, but they didn't actually, which is great, right? but they didn't actually improve beyond baseline. They didn't show any learning. Right. So I thought of putting in the um, longer naps that included REM sleep. Mm -hmm. So then I added a 90 minute nap. Can you put one more click? So in this case, I'm pr I, I have that same perceptual task where it's basically just people have to use their peripheral vision to, um, to uh, determine whether oriented lines are, you know, vertically oriented or horizontally oriented. It's a very simple, simple task, but it goes very quickly. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at sort of peripheral visual processing right. speed. Um, and so I gave it now just twice at 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. And then I looked at the difference score between those to see if did they get worse or did they get better right. um, and just click through. So the no nap condition still showed this deterioration that their performance got worse. So we're still, even if it's only two sessions and there's a whole day of recovery, your brain is still not able to recover from this training. Um, but if you give people a nap of 90 minutes, we actually showed performance that was beyond baseline and we showed increases in performance. And that's including, that 90 minutes includes the REM. Exactly. So that's one with REM and slow wave sleep and stage two sleep. Mm -hmm. And then we wanted to compare the magnitude of benefit on that perceptual task to a f from a nap to that of a full night of sleep. So we had another group of people just test at night, have a full night of sleep and come back in the morning. And then you can click one more time. And what we found is that the nap um, was equal to a night of sleep in terms of, of, in terms of performance. Terms of performance yeah. And it was, what's interesting is, is when we looked at how that people were sleeping, we showed that people actually, the slow wave sleep and the REM sleep were vitally important, that you needed to have both. Did you compare the time of naps? Like um, this nap is, I think, noon, right? And then you extended it to 90 minutes to include REM in addition to slow wave sleep. Did you ever look at like a morning nap? I didn't do that in this nap? study, but I did do it in another study. And it, it is it, it really does work that the naps that have slow wave sleep 
um, th- sorry, the naps that occur in the morning really have almost no slow wave sleep. Yeah. Um, but uh, they do have a lot of REM sleep. Yeah. So this, uh, you did this in 2003. Why have I been seeing a lot of like, don't take a nap, you know, in your day, um, save it up for it's, your night. It's just a long history of, of sleep clinicians mm. not believing in naps. Um, and I think that it comes from insomnia. One of, one of the most uh, effective ways of getting people to sleep better who have insomnia is to not let them get any sleep at all, mm-hmm. not during the day at all, and shorten their period of sleep so that they have these only like four or five hours in bed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they get to sleep really late at night and they have to wake up really early and basically like force them to associate actually exhaustion and sleep with their bed. Mm. So that's a very um, oft-used treatment for insomnia. And it created the um, mentality around naps in the sleep field that naps are terrible for nighttime sleep. Mm. But I'll say that all of my research um, su- research subjects always have good nighttime sleep. Okay. So these nap studies, um, these nap results are always on top of um, good sleep. A uh, good nighttime yeah. sleep. So it's not. It's they're never replacement naps. Got it. Yeah. What about? Um, what have you been? Have you found anything regarding uh, motor skill learning? And yeah, how we that did the to same sleep? research and a whole bunch of other people. And so this was like one of the first nap studies of this kind, and then now it became people use naps now all the time because it's a way easier way to do sleep research than having people sleep all night, and yeah. just, and you have way better controls, mm-hmm. right? Because you can really time the nap and figure out I want to nap with REM sleep or without REM sleep or with slow wave sleep or without slow wave sleep. So people really use naps a lot now. Um, and so they've looked at motor learning and showed nap the same benefits from a nap as a nighttime of sleep and motor learning, creativity, attention, working memory, like all sorts of things. And all those things are same thing. 90 minutes, noon to three, where you have both slow wave and REM sleep to get like a balanced Not necessarily. There's a lot of different types of studies. So okay. some people are looking at, um, they only think that non-REM is important. So they may not add, they may have just like a 60 minute nap or a 45 minute nap because they just want to have a little bit of slow wave sleep and not so much. And they don't care about REM sleep. So every study has its own kind of flavor. Got it. But what what is your thought on motor learning? Is that more of like, do you want more REM? Do you want more slow wave well, the early studies on motor learning were showing that it's actually stage two sleep mm. and the sleep spindles that mm. were good for motor learning. And it turns out that um, that I mean that's probably still true in terms of some element of it, but I think it's probably pretty nuanced because motor learning has the quality of actually showing, you know, you get motor fatigue, mm-hmm. um, and then there's learning also. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of more similar to the perception, right? Is that you can have perceptual fatigue, but learning on top of that as well. So so I think that um, we don't really understand what is sleep doing in terms of um, increasing accuracy versus just uh, decreasing fatigue. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Can we talk about other methods of optimizing sleep? Sure. Temperature. 